All right, calling the meeting to order of the RMLD. This meeting of the Reading Municipal Light Department, RMLD Board of Commissioners, is being videotaped at RMLD's office at 230 Ash Street, Reading, Mass., for the distribution to the community television stations in Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and their address prior to speaking. It's the role of the chair to maintain order and all public comment or ensuing discussion. Okay, a couple introductions we have uh, for the Citizens Advisory Board, Jason Small. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. And uh, Dave, will you be secretary for the evening? Dave Talbot. Be, yes. Dave Talbot. Public comment. Um, doesn't look like there is any. And then um, the Citizens Advisory Board. Jason, do you want to give us an update um, on? Uh, yes, we met uh, several times throughout the month of April to go over the capital budget and the operating budget, which we're going to hear tonight, as well as a proposed rate case. Uh, the advisory board has voted to recommend all three for approval. Excellent. Great. The, uh, rate case was a little contested, three to two. Is that again? The rate case was contested a little bit, three to two. Three to two. Okay. All right. <coughs> Okay, today we have um, the RMLD fiscal year 2019 operating budget. On, 2000, on April 30th, 2018, the CAB voted to recommend that the board approve the 2019 operating budget, so now we'll hear it today. Wendy? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Good evening. here to present the uh, FY19 operating budget. And in front of you, you do have a little packet that sums it up because there is a lot of information to follow. So I thought this year maybe we could um, do it in this format and maybe it's less confusing. And then if we have questions, we can go over those. All right. We appreciate okay. the efforts for less confusion. Yes. Jane. Okay, so uh, just a couple highlights. The fixed costs represent 81.73% uh, of the overall operating budget. The increase in the fixed costs from FY18 to FY19 was 1.25%. Semi-variable costs represent 18.27% of the overall operating budget with uh, the increase of those costs from FY18 to 19 is 7.98%. The overall operating budget increase from FY18 to 19 is projected to be 2.41%. And as of 228.18, uh, which is eight months actual, the FY18 budget expenses are projected to come in at 2.71% higher than anticipated due to unprecedented storm costs in March. Okay, so I'm going to turn to the uh, page that pretty much sums everything up and uh, puts it into perspective for everyone. This is the fixed cost versus the semi-variable cost. So what it does is uh, show you exactly how much of the expenses we have um, no control over and how much we do. So the fixed costs, which are your power costs, your depreciation expense, our current commitment to the uh, town of Reading and the other four towns, and then of course a small portion for miscellaneous deductions um, for loss on disposal of property is 81.73%. Those are our fixed costs. The semi-variable costs of 18.27% are broken down. Um, first, labor is at 6.66% of the budget, and then you get into your employee benefits and pension at 3.91% of the budget. So right there, you're looking at over 10.5% uh, of the 18% remaining that is basically tied to three labor contracts for uh, employees and benefits. And then you get into the remaining 
portion of the budget, which is 1% or lower. So uh, would you like me to go over each one of those? Sure. Okay. So the conservation expenses are 1% of the budget. Overtime represents 1%. Tree trimming is almost at 1% of the budget. You have your legal and professional services at uh, a little more than a three quarters percent of the budget. Then you have your other general administrative expenses, uh, basically your department expenses, whatever is necessary to continue um, running the, the office, 0.61% of the budget. Customer processing fees, which is the, uh, the cost of doing business, especially through automation, is a little over half a percent of the budget. Maintenance of the building and the garages, about half a percent of the budget. Property insurance, less than half a percent. Then you have other operating and maintenance expenses. Once again, these are things for our operations side um, to continue day-to-day -day operations, small expenses that they need to do their jobs, 0.40% of the budget. Maintenance of the general plant, this basically represents um, software maintenance or anything to do with computers, I would say it that way, 0.35% of the budget. Vehicle expense, you have 3.32% of the budget, and then we have um, what I've added this year is your vehicle capital clearing account. So that shows you how much of the vehicle's uh, expenses are actually going to capital expenses. So that's 0.30%. So really, on the operating budget, you're at 0.02% of vehicle expense. And then, of course, we leave room for hazardous materials of transformers, um, just in case we have some leaks, which we have had in the past, 0.31% of the budget. Your training and tuition for staff, a quarter percent of the budget. Rent expense, less than a quarter percent. Bad debt expense at 0.11% of the budget. Injuries and damages, which is uh, insurances and claims, 0.05%. And of course, the RMLB and the CAB, 0.03%. And your office supplies at 0.02%. So that, that shows you where the categories are for each, um, for each expense. Any questions on that in particular in this moment? Yep. Yeah, Go Wendy, ahead. am I reading? So the uh, FY18, uh, it's eight months actual for, for its budget, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So am I reading this correctly? So we're the 19, FY19 budget's actually lower than uh, our, proje our yes. projected? Yes, because um, so FY19 budget overall is lower. That is correct. Because uh, first of all, if you look at the top, the power costs are a little bit higher for 18 than they are for 19. Yeah. Okay, they're coming down a little bit. Yep. And uh, then um, what we're projecting in FY18 for the variable are actually uh, lower than 19. Yep. So it's really coming in the power. The yep. power is going down. Yep. Okay, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman? Yes. What makes up legal and professional? I, I okay, so legal and professional, yeah, okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, legal and professional. So what happened is um, legal, of course, is legal, and then of all your outside contract fees. So as what are the numbers? What are the numbers? I'm looking for numbers. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. So legal and professional. So in FY18, we budgeted $472,000. What we're looking to come in at currently is $662,000. So we uh, underestimated the budgeting, and I'll tell you why. It's because we have these placeholders for employees that we haven't hired. And as we've discussed in prior uh, meetings, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the, but the column that says fiscal year 19, 2019 budget. I'm looking for the breakdown of what's in there, please. The 811,000. 811,000. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Please. Thank you. Hmm. So the the actual I don't have the breakdown of what's actually legal and what's actually contract in front of me right now. I can send you that if you want. But what I'm explaining, what I'm trying to explain to you, Phil, is um, the difference and why the budget has changed. Well, if, you know, if, if I may, um, <laughs> if you look at in historically, uh, the 17 budget was about 400,000 and the actual was about 850,000. So, right. you know, so uh, cl clearly there was more spent on probably consulting as well as uh, legal uh, within that. So it, lo it looks that the 18 budget, which was increased a little bit, but the year to date is actually down from mm -hmm. 17. So we didn't use it as much. And then if I were to surmise, it looks like 19, you put it in there because the, the previous two years have been uh, sort of trending upward. Correct, and we're also expecting more consulting services. Yeah. 
That's the project. So in 17, the actual is, is at the 800, <coughs> mostly because it was a contract year for all the uh, labor negotiations. But uh -huh. once again, the placeholders for the uh, employees that we haven't been able to hire, and that you know that makes us go out and seek help because the jobs have to get done. Well, because you need uh, to, 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 to be able to hire people, you need to have exactly. professionals go look for them. And That's right. Okay, search search firms. No, no, we actually need some professionals to do the job. So contracting. That's oh, so contracting. Right. Yeah, I see. Yes. Yeah. So, so that doesn't go so into labor. Happening. That doesn't go into regular labor. That no, it does not. Yeah. Hmm. Labor is just the actual people mm -hmm. who are employed by the RMLD. Ah, okay, that makes makes sense. So we don't we don't have a breakdown of that number. She as has it. She's going to have to. As far as how much is legal and yeah. how much is contract, yes. I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry, Phil. I'm not happy about that. I'll be honest Apologize. with you. I'm not happy about that. I mean, that was, I mean, it will affect my vote here because I don't, I, I, I don't see the detail on some of these. So. I mean, I can have it for you. To, I can send it to you through email tonight because we're voting on this tomorrow. Yeah, we don't. We're voting this tomorrow? I'll be yeah, we both on vote. Happy to get that vote information. Tomorrow. Okay, all right, that's no. fine. We vote that's on fine. The total We get it to me tonight that yes. it, or tomorrow. No problem. I'll be sleeping tonight, so tomorrow is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. You'll sleep better tonight. No, you're going to get that, I think. And I okay. apologize. I, I have a, just a question on the yeah. yes. um, employee benefits and pension. Uh, yes. So that's increased quite a bit as well. Yep. Uh, and what is the rationale for that? So I'll explain that to you. So uh, if you remember, the audit was postponed uh, at at length due to the actuarial reports that hadn't come in on time. So we had old actuarial reports that we were basing the budget on and the numbers were not accurate that we based the budget on. Sure. And uh, so that's the that's the yep. problem there. Yep. Mr. Chair. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Wendy, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to recall where we are. Maybe Colleen remembers uh, with respect to the change in fiscal year and is that going to impact the budgeting decisions and process now I'm trying to remember the uh, currently I, I I believe it is not going to impact it because we're going to go forward with this as a fiscal year budget and then uh, once you make a decision to change to calendar year then we would so then that's again still, uh, present that still has not been finalized right right is it on the agenda for tomorrow night it is okay, okay. Yeah. and then we would present another uh, budget in September for calendar year 19 okay. yes Sorry. Yep. Yeah, so we'd basically, the, I'm trying to think of the mechanics of it, so it would be tomorrow night would be approving a fiscal year budget that would could subsequently be right. changed and right. to accommodate the... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But would it be cut right in half, everything? Um, I, think we would, I think we would look at it all over again yeah. and present a new budget that, you know, we, we have six months in here and make sure that it's still in line with um, the way we're, we're moving. Mm. It's always difficult when you make that transition. Right. You know, you can't get, you will not be 100% accurate. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. that's a given. Right. But, so you have to be flexible on the one year transition. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question, this, this data came out of a, another page, um, yes. which we don't have here in front of us, but it's, I just had a very simple question um, off of the, um, budget for 18 versus the budget for 19 on page 93. Uh, it was the interest income. It yes. went from uh, 150,000 to projected 250,000. So right. very positive increase um, in the um, interest income. Wh why is that? Did we change banks? Well, on honestly, no, we have not changed banks. But I honestly believe that it was under budgeted because it's a tough number to pinpoint because you don't really know what the percentage is going to come in at. So you hate to overestimate something like that. I mean, I know it's insignificant, it's $100,000, um, but I looked at the numbers closer this year and going more in lines of, uh, um, of how the interest is coming in, so I, you know, I feel good about that number. Okay, good. Honestly. I was just curious. Uh, yes. Yeah, there, we have, there we, our processes have changed yeah. at all. Yeah. Good. Okay. I'm going to move on to the slide. Yep. Yep. All right. Great. So uh, I just did a couple slides here just to uh, put some things into perspective. So the first slide shows the budgeted net income compared to the budgeted rate of return. So looking at FY18 to FY23, you can see uh, the blue lines represent our projected net income and the orange line represents the projected rate of return. So um, basically we've been trying to target 8% and then of course as we've discussed, we're trying to go down to a more reasonable and responsible uh, rate of return for our customers. 
uh, down to about 6% over the next six years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the second slide shows the budgeted kilowatt hours sold compared to the budgeted rate of return. And uh, as we've been saying, it looks like kilowatt hour sales are going to be decreasing by about 1% every year going forward. Of course, that in this moment, that's, that's all we can see in this particular moment. Um, and that just shows your kilowatt hour sales, what they're projected to come in at for FY18 through to FY23, and uh, how it falls in line with the rate of return as well. And the last slide, I think I've already presented this to you in a regular uh, board session, but I think it's helpful to uh, put into perspective especially uh, leading up to the capital budget for tomorrow, where the funds come from in order to fund our capital projects. So we're continuously, we're, we're continuously adding to whatever it is that the net income comes in at. Um, so you have your depreciation expense, of course, in orange. That's your 3%. That's restricted for capital projects. And then you have the gray portion is what management has decided would be the best, um, the appropriate amounts, I, I would say, to transfer to capital in order to sustain the balance of at least a million dollars um, going forward, knowing what the projects are coming up at. And then you have your yellow portion, which is uh, represents other proceeds and bond proceeds that we are foreseeing that we would need to go um, and uh, well, that's for the substation, gotcha. correct? Yes, that's correct. So I just think that this helps to visualize it and see that uh, all the money that we're making is actually going back into the system and more. Yes. Uh, so, Wendy, I'm trying to remember. I know there was some discussion at the last meeting around the uh, – the study with respect to payment to the town and yes. I know the cab had some discussion. So currently uh, in the, this, uh, any expense for that would be in the operating budget? Yes, it is there. So right. because we're currently, uh, we have a commitment currently that we haven't uh, decided one way or another about, we have put it into the budget as what it is uh, supposed to be paid out at the 2.51% CPI based on FY18's number. So okay. we have put that number in there. Right, but that's not for <coughs> that. That's for the the payment. But I mean, we also talked about a study which would take a look at. Uh, this is goes. Oh, back the to um, the cost for the study right. is not in there. Okay. No. Right. Because at the time we did not, we weren't aware that we were going to need this. But by the time we finalized this budget, this discussion had happened after the finalization right. of the budget. So no, so, we have so not um, accounted I, for it. And I know there was some input from CAB. So. Uh, I think what we'd be saying then is we would be voting on the budget as, as it's c currently constituted without any uh, yes. money included for that. If, if at some point the determination was we should or we want to talk about going through that, that would be brought up for approval to the CAB and to the board for consideration. Right. But as I mentioned to the CAB as well, because it was a, as was a big concern, that I feel confident up through uh, March, as much as I thought we would be over budget with the storms, it looks like we're still stabilized with our numbers and I feel confident that this study providing that it's a reasonable cost yep. it could possibly be absorbed within the budget because we're not a line item budget and uh, since we were consistently under budget this year yep. it's possible that it would be ab absorbed barring a May snowstorm I'm oh, sorry barring a May snowstorm yes exactly <laughs> barring, bar, barring the system blowing up <laughs> yeah, that's okay, thank you yeah. Wendy, on the first page when you talked about that expenses came in 2.71% higher than expected? That's what the, we're projecting them to come in. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, is that 2.71% of the whole budget yes. or just of the variable budget? No, of the whole budget because um, I think uh, Hamid's going to discuss this tomorrow night, but okay. it looks like March storms are costing, were costing us about $700,000. Wow. Did not uh, foresee. Big budget raise. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yes. The, the um, Go ahead, Dave. Tree trimming is up about 150 grand. Yes. I just wondered what that was about. I mean, do you have any uh, anything to share on that tree trimming? 
thought the storm would have uh, taken care of some of that for us. Well, you did. Some of that did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still, it's still <laughs> I mean, 900, 898, I'm just wondering how many years do we think that we have to spend that level of money to, to trim trees every year? I mean, at some point, the trees have been trimmed, right? Um, yes, they, they, I know they grow. You set yourself up for that one. I know trees, I know they grow. <laughs> yes? It's a five-year cyclic plant. Yep. Which means, you know, you're, you're doing the main feeders and then you're going around, and by the time you get back, you go around again. You mean you leave one area of the you footprint, you, you, you go to another area. You the entire area. territory into, yeah. into five-year sections doing your main feeders first, and then you have to do your laterals. And by the time you come around to start again, it's five years. And what Hamid's saying is when you're going around in that five years, there may be certain species in certain areas that grow more than others, and instead of coming around and starting again, you've got to go back over here and do a little bit more. Then you go back and you start again. And that is forever okay. um, so it's it's um it's your number one cause of outages and we probably got one of the best tree trim in fact we've got such a good tree trimming program and not necessarily cost but expanding to the eight foot um cut uh what and we went to a span per span saved us money Every single utility in this area has all adopted our program because of how much it's cut down on outages. Yeah. With also the exception of rain, you know, the years that you have so much rain, the control crashes, so you don't have to do it every you know, five years to what happens to you. So then, you know, you don't have to go back to the area and do it again. There had been a, requ uh, a request earlier this year to possibly put a small amount of money in our budget to do tree planting. Yeah, um, I know it's, it's yes. So we're actually, I called Mary Ellen yep. and told her that we yeah, were yeah. going to join uh, this. It's it's like a society of utilities yep. and trees, and you participate in an Arbor Day, and you plant a certain amount of trees, and you provide education uh, on trees. You also provide education about how your utility cuts directional pruning and the health and aesthetics of the trees, um, and it ends up putting in a certain amount of trees, but not sh what she had asked was, how about you give us all 10,000 a year? This is more puts back into the community through this um, society that, that all the utilities belong to. And it's, um, so that way it's, you know, you're not, it, it's a holistic program as opposed to earmarking like uh, Christmas lights, you know, okay, well, how many trees do you need this year and how many trees? It's educational and everything. So what does it provide to the town? It provides educational tools. It provides. It, we don't give the town trees. It donates trees through the society. You know what I mean. The town doesn't end up getting trees. No, the town. It, it does end up getting trees. Because one one thought is, I mean, there's certain species we all know, like those uh, Norway maples. They grow really fast. They split in a heavy snow and pines. That if we were promoting other species that don't do that, then we prevent long-term problems by having the towns get the right kind of trees to. So I don't know if that's part of this. Well, we're just, like I said, we're, we're interviewing um, a bunch of societies right now to see which one's the best, but I'm sure the master arborists and stuff would probably be working with the town wardens of what types of trees would work best. But uh, it is investing in the trees and, and, and putting back for where we, while we have to remove them in order to keep the electric on, right. we do realize that, you know, we want to replicate as best we can, but if you can't do a one for one, it's not cost uh, of effective. Of course, I mean, like you know what I mean about the Norway maples. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But I can I can send you some literature on um, 
the tree program. It was one of the things that Mary Ellen had on yeah, her yeah. list when yeah. she yeah, came. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe in a couple of meetings from now, we can have a, an agenda item and, and learn more about it and say, put out a release or something explaining this. I think the foundation is fine. Yeah. yeah. I was really getting at kind of the cause of it. Right. Right? Well, that Hot too, but coffee. also just it's something we, you know, in the spirit of helping the towns, it's something we can do. Yeah. You know, it's not much money for us, but yeah. um, and, if, and if we push it in the right direction in terms of where they're planted and the, the species, it comes out even, especially when we're spending 900 grand a year cutting trees. Um, if we spent 40 grand making sure the right ones got planted, you know, maybe that pays back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Um, just so you know, though, it, it's not just cutting. It's 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 rolling the trucks. It's bringing in cranes. We had all of those storms where big trees come down. We have to have cranes come yeah. in. Uh, it's getting rid of uh, wood waste. Wood waste is very expensive. They have to chip it all, and they have to pay to you know to, to dispose of it. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty big t production, yeah. besides just trimming the tree back. We pay to get rid of chips. Can it's all part of we, we pay per span, so they they uh, calculate. You know, it's just one of those one of those things where there's a there's a wood chip dump at the at the compost where people can get free wood chips, and it just makes me wonder if we're if that's included in contracts where we're paying people to get rid of chips, and yet people are also looking for free chips at the compost. It's it's one of those little areas of cooperation that maybe there's something the next time we do our contract. Yeah, I know, but they're putting a budget line for getting rid of wood waste. So we're paying them to get rid of wood chips, and meanwhile, the citizens looking for free wood chips. You know, I'm, it's, it's I, for I another day. Do we do we move on? Yeah, we'll move yeah. on. Save this yeah. for another yeah. uh, meeting. Yeah, another, another exactly. meeting. I agree with yeah. You. yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, you're gonna put it on the on the agenda in the yep. future. Yep. Right. So. Exactly. Great. Can I just, uh, Colleen? Did you have something that you wanted to add about Tom's question? about the study? Is this no, just that, that, you know, the, the board has the right to direct us to use the operating income. I mean, I mean that's that's oh, what we pay oh, out. So right. if they wanted to use any money that's in the operating income to do a study, they could. Of course. Without having to revise the budget. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't say revise. I said it could possibly be absorbed within the budget. Yeah. Yep. Because it's that's not right. line item budget. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. You misunderstood. Well, it was a question, you know, like De Dennis Kelly had brought up. Right. It's, it's just like, you know, if it's not in the budget, you shouldn't be doing it. it the, the commission has Absolutely. authority on the operating income. Um, Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Any other questions for Wendy? No. Jason? No? Okay. Thanks, Thank Wendy. you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. And now we're going to the proposed rate adjustment. Presented by Jane. much um, as part of the operating budget when we looked at fiscal year 18 to fiscal year 19 uh, the projected base rate increase um, went from 26.136 million to 27.786 million um, <clears throat> so that increase can be um, accomplished two ways uh, one would be if we had growth in kilowatt hour sales we would uh, receive additional revenue um, and the other is through a base rate increase um, right now, historically, we've, we've been having flat to decreasing sales over the last 10 years. Uh, current year, um, year to date through April, it looks like we're down 2%. Um, so based on this budget, <coughs> we project, we've projected a 1% decrease in kilowatt hour sales. So as a result of that, uh, in order to um, accomplish the net income of $4.053 million, um, a rate increase would be necessary. Um, so when we did the cost of service last year, we looked at some of the objectives 
um, and those were to eliminate any subsidizations between rate classes. As we had discussed, um, the residential class was earning a negative rate of return. Um, and so, in essence, those were being subsidized by the commercial, municipal, and industrial class. We also discussed some um, rate subsidizations within classes. Um, and we, uh, we uh, developed a protocol to look at the industrial time of use, and we added a demand component to the PPCT to, to adjust those um, subsidizations. We want to make sure that we have attractive rates for our commercial customers, um, as well as fair rates for all class of customers. Um, so these are some of the highlights that we talked to uh, talked about in 2017. If we go to the next slide, um, we presented two basically scenarios that uh, to both the CAB and to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, a large portion of the rate overall rate increase last year was based on the increase in capacity costs. Um, however. When we looked at scenario one, it was a 5.6 to a 6.5 percent if we just did an overall across the board rate increase. Uh, then we looked at scenario three, which is trying to address some of those cost subsidizations between the rate classes. And uh, ultimately, both the CAB and the Board of Commissioners uh, voted for us to do a scenario three uh, increase where we had slight variations, but we were heading towards a more reasonable cost of service study. Um, with the effect after five years was that the uh, residential customers would have a zero rate of return, which means there would still be a subsidization, but at least they would be breaking even from the municipal standpoint, as opposed to having a negative rate of return. Um, and that proposal was to be accomplished over small increments so as to avoid any rate shock or, or huge rate swings in any rate class. Um, and so this is what we ended up going with uh, as an overall increase, and I do want to emphasize that the majority of that increase was associated by, um, as based on the capacity increase. So in the NEMA load zone, this past fiscal year is when we hit the all-time capacity increase, and that's rolled into these actual rates. So if we go to the next slide, we kind of have the, those two scenarios uh, as options if we want to still continue on that path. Obviously, the, the board is voting on just a one-year um, increase if they so choose. Um, so I presented kind of the two, uh, two scenarios. If we were to do a, a, a uniform across-the-board race uh, increase, excuse me, it would go anywhere between a 1.7 and a 2.4, depending on your customer class. Uh, and that is all based on your usage, how the, how the rate is designed. Uh, the commercial, municipals, and school components have a demand component. Residential is just a distribution energy, and then we have the purchase power costs. Uh, if we were to continue towards that, uh, again, we wouldn't get to that zero cost of service, but we would be heading it. It would be a slightly higher increase for the residential, uh, as well as the residential time of use, and a, sm uh, a lower across the board increase for the school, commercial, and the industrial. Again, they're all relatively um, small increases. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't exceed 3%, and it's, again, it's anywhere between, you know, 1% and 3%, depending on how you, how you use your power. Uh, so, you know, we kind of, if we look to the next slide, please. Uh, to tie into that last slide, uh, we talked about the residential time of use. Um, and the way the rate is currently filed is the time of use component is on the distribution energy component, and that's how the RMLD recovers our fixed costs associated with the poles, the transformers, how we bill and everything uh, related to that. That really doesn't have a time of use component because whether you use your power during the day or at night, um, shouldn't really make a difference because RMLD needs to collect that revenue um, in order for us to, to, to function. So what we're proposing is to <coughs> fix that component um, so it's a flat rate for all hours and then make the fuel charge as the first step the time of use component. So we would use the same fuel charge that we currently have developed for the industrial com commercials. That's about a three, ten, a three cent off peak charge and a ten cent on peak, depending on the average fuel charge. Um, and then 
down the road we would incorporate the PPCT to be more reflective of an on and off. Um, right now, the way we're doing that with our commercial customers is we have a demand component that we're gradually ramping up. This current um, fiscal year was at $4. Uh, the proposed increase for next year would be $8, and then the following year would be $12. And that's really what it's costing us in terms of capacity uh, and transmission. Um, and so we would have to incorporate that not using a demand meter for residentials, but more as an on-peak and off-peak, but that's going to be in later um, proposals. Um, so that's just kind of a summarizing where we would be on the residential time of use. And then the last slide, uh, last two slides. This is the scenario one, which I believe everybody has. Um, and it just kind of gives uh, you an in, uh, a dollar impact. So if we were to look at scenario one, a customer that uses 500 kilowatt hours um, would see a monthly increase of approximately $1.97. Uh, someone who uses 750, the increase would be $2.82, um, et cetera. And it goes through the various classes. Um, if you look at the next slide, and I know it's hard to read the slides here, but I think you should have them hopefully on your tablets. We do. Um, yep. The scenario three, uh, rather than if we look at just the 500 kilowatt residential, instead, instead of his bill, his or her bill going up $1.97, it would go up $2.27. So it's just a 30, it's a 30 cent differential, but we would be trending towards a more um, cost of service with that zero return based on that customer class. Jane, I have a quick question. Certainly. You said it would be phased in on that first slide correct um, over three or four years correct so it you're saying in 2019 people might only see a half a percent increase so on again average. it would all depend on how the budget came in how the power supply portion would come in because it, it's it's the overall increase to the customers and so what we're trying to do is again I'll just use uh, theoretical examples if next year's budget um, the overall increase was a 1% in overall increase. In order to achieve this gradual, we might recommend a 1.2 residential and a 0.8 commercial. And again, it's just to kind of give you the slight variation so you're gradually going to get to a point where you're at a zero rate of return for the residentials and then any increases from that point on would be a uniform increase. Hmm. Um, so you're just kind of staggering how you get there as opposed to having a significant increase. In one year. In one year. But last year we did have the significant increase. And again, in as, I, as I emphasized when we looked at that, um, you know, if you, I have some notes on that. So, Wendy, if you could go back to that FY18 one. Next, one more. So of the 6.6% residential increase, so of that $5.07, over $3.14 was related to power supply alone. So that was going to happen whether there was a rate increase or not because by law, passed through, right? we passed that through. Okay. The RMLD does not make any return on that, and we have to recover our production costs. But we, didn't, we decided not to phase this one in. You did. Oh, we did. Okay. We did. So that was the 6.6. .6. Okay. If you had de uh, decided, oh, yeah. Three to five it would years. have been 5.6. Okay. So again, that was a 1% shift. And because we made some progress, if you go to the next one, Wendy, please, we're only talking a 0.3 differential. So whereas last year was a 1%, again, mm -hmm. we're able to do it in smaller portions because okay. we're doing it over five years. All right. Does that answer your question, Dave? I think so. It, it, it's a little tricky because of the, the components that make up the rate, and it's not just a one-line item where we're, we're voting in to have you know, a 3% rate increase. There's various components of the bill, um, which, you know, capacity, transmission, energy, and then the cost of operating the RMLD. So they all, they're, all, they're all differently um, different increases and decreases and we're, when we're when we're speaking of this we're talking about overall increase because that's really what the customer really wants to know right. is what's the effect on my net bill right. so like a residential mm -hmm. person next year what would the overall 
depending um, on what scenario that, that's what that's what those okay. two scenarios it was either a dollar 97 for someone who used uh 500 kilowatts a month mm -hmm. to another 30 cents two dollars okay. and all right 27 cents okay thanks 27 cents you just a, a quick question sure. from a, a, on a relative source do you have any sense about what national grid or eversource are increasing theirs because they're going to face the same thing correct so, yeah so um again i i'm working on those studies to try to determine the power supply piece versus the cost of operating and, and to kind of track those so we can have that that clear benchmark from a strategic standpoint um national grid and ever sources are 30 to 50 percent higher than us right um so they go out for standard offer national grid goes out in may and october and Eversource goes out in January and June. And so they stagger that every six months. And we've been historically consistently 30 to 50% uh, lower than them. That, that jives with <laughs> my, my house and the other place where I have, uh, you know, National Grid. It's exactly right. It's about 50% less. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So. Questions for Jane? So. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, Mike, don't go, go yet. Don't go yet. Oh, yep. My my question is: the CAB had a problem with this. Why? What was their What was their issue? Maybe Jason can um, understand. That. It was just around trying not to do a rate increase this year. Was the main issue, and seeing if there was other places we could recuperate the two percent, you know, the one percent drop in kilowatt hour sales, and maybe like a one percent increase. Um, so there was some discussion around that. Um, most of. Uh, it was difficult to see in the operating budget where there was room to, to trim a lot of the, the bulk of the budget's fixed. Right. So there wasn't a whole lot of room to look to offset that, that variable. So okay. ultimately. Okay. That's a good question, Phil. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do do we need to vote on that? Of some sort? Do we need to do anything? We don't have to do anything. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're. I think we're done. Any other comments from the board? I just have one comment. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted, Jane. Is there a? Uh, so for tomorrow, what will we be voting on? Is that available to, to talk about now? What do we? Yeah. So tomorrow, when, when in order for us to file rates. Is there a recommendation from, say, from your perspective, from the staff's perspective, in terms of? Well, my recommendation is to continue with uh, what we voted on last year, move towards a zero, uh, you know, a good? true cost of, that's three, a true yeah. cost of service. <coughs> I mean, the residential had gotten to minus 11. Uh, and we're trying to bring that back to center so that we can, uh, again, it all fits into the future, into the financials and, and collecting a, a true cost of service and a cost mm -hmm. of production. Is it also uh, a point of discussion with the commercial side in terms of their um, expectations? Of well, the, the rate was adjusting the subsidations uh, appropriately. And so, yes, the commercial was slightly going down, residential was slightly yeah. going up but because the subsidations were off they had just gotten out of whack over the years and needed to be brought back but have we gotten feedback from the commercial customers around the, the need to be more uh, fair about that process I mean to what, to what extent they had understanding of the I think we wrote an article last year on rates and, and we had a discussion in the paper about what the, what the plan was yeah I didn't know if some of our bigger customers have asked us to be more you know be more what? concerned about that which I know you, you are doing yeah I, I think we were pretty transparent in yep. the papers for, as far as what we were yeah. trying to do. And as Jane said, we, we didn't do it all at once. We, we were bringing it back in, in, uh, in increments. Yeah. Well, I think it also fits in the discussion we had around, uh, you know, with respect to the town subsidies around looking for more opportunities for growth and development, which starts with having rates that are appropriate, right, and not, right. not subsidizing, you know, the residential side. So that makes sense. Thank you. May I ask a question? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Was there any thought given to changing the time of the time of use rate as opposed to the, the uniform increase across both? I mean, another way to get more money from those people is to shorten the span from 7 p.m. to noon. And that affect yeah, it's an interesting thing, too, because um, just a little side note that some of you may find interesting. Uh, for the first time in ISO history, uh, New England was subject to the duck curve, which means that our daytime lower load was lower <coughs> than our overnight load. Uh, and that, they, they, uh, that happened on our April 21st. Um, so the load at 2 o'clock was less than early morning and late uh, evening. So what accounted for that? Uh, what, they, what they have determined, it was because, uh, as a result of behind the meter photo, photovoltaic, uh, a clear day. Oh, so occasionally on, on those sunny days. And seasonally low loads. So those three factors uh, contributed to that. So those are a couple of days, right? Correct. Yeah. We are looking at things. Uh, I know there's there's different rate structures that you can look at. Um, I've got people in my group looking at um, you know some significant changes. Uh, there's a national group has a smart pricing rate where um, the rate during a peak event is different than their on-peak rate, um, so it goes to be like four times higher um, to encourage people. Right. Um, but you, you would need to have the ability to measure the fact that they weren't using that uh, um, power uh, because it goes to like 53 cents per kilowatt hour during those eight hours. Mm. Uh, so we're looking at that, Dave, um, in terms of it, but um, we have to really study shortening that window because you right. know, transmission peaks are occurring a little outside that window now. Um, we, had a, we had a peak, and again, it's seasonal. So we have to kind of look to make sure we're capturing that. We, we, we used to have our on-peak rate from 10 in the morning to 8 at night. We shrunk that from 12 to 8. Um, and now we just have to look because the load shape of New England is changing. So we have to be cautious. Or having, since you have these meters up already, having three different prices for three different time spans. You could do that, right? Like if there's a super cheap part of the night where we're paying nothing for wholesale or very little, shape your your, your overnight loads to those times. Correct. Versus 7 p.m., yeah, which is- Yeah, we used to have seasonal rates in place, and again, we have to look at the billing system to make sure that the meters, the billing system can handle it, but those, those are definitely options to consider. Are you, are you talking about uh, shoulder peaks and a max peak in, sure. e in each day? And, sure. and like mean, there are plan right. there are utilities that have that like they they program the meter to have like you have the morning then you have the beginning of the right there's the three time different, of you, there's three three different, different prices three mm. different prices right yeah, because it, it and that's closer it follows more closely what your costs are exactly and that makes sense to me but just keeping the time the same and doubling somebody's rate versus somebody else's rate seems like a kind of a it would be nice to see other other approaches to, to Well, I'm not sure that's why the time of use changed, right? The, yeah, time, we're of not doubling anything. the time of use changed. Repeat why the time of use changed. It wasn't... Uh, well, you're seeing a 7.6% under your preferred scenario 3 versus 3.5% for somebody else. That's, that's twice, a high, twice as much of a rate increase for one category of customers over another. Was it based on the You have seven point six percent for residential t time of use, and you get three point five for commercial. Nobody was seven point six percent. The highest for the residential time of use was two point three six. What's I think you you're talking about the two thousand eighteen increase. Uh, oh, is that what we? Is this? Yeah. yeah. Dave's talking about the two thousand eighteen increase. Yeah, and that was related to the cap increase. Okay, so that was last year's increase. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah, well, so I made a mistake, didn't I? Um, distribution. It happens. Yeah. 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 It happens. It happens. Happen occasionally. It happens. It happens. It happens. Happens. Distribution associated with time of use. You can use that. <laughs> can you tell me that, please? Sure. Dave, what we're going, again, we're trying to transition to that. Got it. And one of the changes that we're proposing for the residential time of use is instead of having an on-peak and an off-peak distribution charge, yep. we're going to have a flat distribution charge because we have to recover the cost of our distribution, and it's not really time sensitive. We 
weren't recovering distribution. Right. So you, you get a break in, in the cost of energy because you're using it off peak. Right. But we can't give a break in poles and wires and labor to keep the system going and that, that was true. embedded into the thing. So that's why Can you reduce changed. your labor rates for the time you use customers? I'm just making a joke. <laughs> can, can we cable that item? I'm <laughs> 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 my mistake by making a bad joke. Um, <laughs> when the robots run the organization. Con Ed, yeah. by the way, Con Ed is in New York. Like their, their, their day rates are like 25, 25 cents, and their overnight rates are like a penny. But it's from like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. only. So th there's interesting things Correct. happening. Correct. And we're looking, and we're looking at that. Uh, one of the, I, uh, as I was mentioned earlier, one of the looks like the, during the peak event is 55 cents. Yeah. Or just something. That's so great. Ways to structure so you're sending price signals to people not to even holiday people. Is the can I may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, is the Eaton uh, module that we put into these old icons? Um, that has a timely use. Control. Yeah, but when you make it timely use, can you cut it into soft peak, max peak, and shoulder peak? So we might be able to do that because that's how California does yeah. it too. They do the three. But, but you have to keep, as Jane says, even if you do the three, you yeah. have to keep looking at what's how it's shifting. Yeah, yeah. You know and then I mean? change it every year if you have to. People have to learn how to act differently. Yep. Thank you. Phil, you've been waiting. That's all right. I, I just want to, we, we said with all that. Oh, yes. Uh, Bob Scioli. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just want to mention everybody that, you know, I, I attended the uh, his memorial service on Saturday. Oh, good. I actually spoke. They're kind of like, they're kind of like an Irish wake they gave him, you know? where people got up and spoke about him. And uh, one of the things that was mentioned that uh, his service on this committee was very important to him. So, you know, he served from 2002 to 2014 mm -hmm. in one of the original three, and that seat is now uh, occupied by Mr. Hennessy. Uh, actually, Mr. O'Rourke uh, occupies that seat. He succeeded Bob Soley. And Bob Soley, for one year, served in another seat that was vacated after Marcy West and uh, Dave Mancuso, and you, you succeeded him. Right. right. So yeah. Bob was a good man, and he and I butted head many times, you know? Yeah. And they used to make me worried when we agreed on things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second that. I, uh, uh, Bob took me under his wing when I first came on and sort of taught me some of the basics and uh, about the economics of the system, and yeah. he was a great teacher. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And a very... Uh, very uh, solicitous for the rate payer. Yeah. He's always looking yeah, after the rate payer. Elderly customers and yeah. very always right. thinking about yeah. people who needed help. Mm -hmm. So a great legacy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I ask one more yes. question back on the budget? Just so I'm clear, Phil. So we use FERC accounting. You know, so FERC account 923 captures all outside services. Okay, it's it's all combined. So typically, si similar to overhead uh, maintenance tree trimmings in overhead maintenance. So the only time you break something out is when someone says, can you break apart that? But you're still gonna have a lot left in there. So we're gonna break out legal out of outside services. We're gonna break out uh, training is already broken out. Is there is there anybody else that would like something broken out of? Because each FERC bucket has a lot of things in it. So we only break stuff out if, if people have specific requests that they wanna know it's a good time what to an ask. Integral, yeah. What an integral cost is. Bill, it um, seems like that's a question for you. Um, the, only one I had, the only thing I asked was just the legal, okay. the legal and then professional fees. That was the breakdown. Because yep. I didn't see that anywhere in the package that I had. I don't know if it was broken out in the past. Was it? Yes, it has been. Oh, it has. Has it been? At least, you know. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I've only been here 32 years, so. <laughs> I, I think we did see the legal in past years because there were some extremely high rates per hour that were being charged. Yep. And we were wondering, I mean, on to the tune of seven to $800 an hour. Oh, right. Was like yeah, well, that's insane. That's All right, right. So. Yeah. so I guess the answer to Colleen's question is be... Yep. So just in the future, if you want yep. something else broken up, if you say, you know, well, what's in overhead construction? Yeah. Or what is in, I'm, I'm trying to think of another one, right. like typical, typically people like to see the tree trimming broken out of overhead. Mm -hmm. um, um, they like to see training as opposed to, because that training is also in the same FERC code. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think of another the overtime, they like to see that broken out of labor. So I, 
like I said, if there's anything else, I mean, we're gonna, next year is the last phase and we're gonna get into the FERC accounting so that you can see what each one of them is. Yep. And um, in that way, if you want breakouts, we can we can do it further if you want. Okay, Jim. yes. Yeah, <coughs> just before we leave the operating budget, so Colleen, we, uh, I guess from my perspective to make sure, I, I know we've carried uh, uh, <coughs> unfilled positions for different reasons, some availability of talent or just not being able to get the right people at the right time. So in this budget, do you do you have enough headcount covered right. for the needs for right. the budget? Yeah, actually it, it's, there's about seven vacancies. Uh, it's, it's not so much that we can't find somebody. It, it's, it's more like we did the reorganization study on a high level yeah. and then we've gone through uh, 75 percent of the groups at a lower level and when you start switching things around you have to work with the unions on new job descriptions and you have to make sure that that job description doesn't it doesn't go from this union and cross over into this union so writing the job descriptions and having everyone agree on it uh, after they've accepted the reorganization uh, is just time consuming sure. yeah, and I so you it. it's just um, yeah I'm more concerned that the budget as stated now has uh, coverage for the positions yeah. you still want to fill yeah and I feel like we'll make a lot of progress this year just because we're, we're coming up on the last two areas that we're working on mm -hmm. and then we're coming up on another negotiating year um, you would think that you could just reorganize write the job description say this is what we're doing mm -hmm. man management can con direct and control Somebody yep. negotiated that's, that that's out. That's corporate we, America. Apparently, they <laughs> negotiated that out long before I got here. So yeah. it's uh, it, it it's not as easy, and it's and it's inefficient, uh, yeah. and it's um, frustrating. It, and but it's it, but it's working slowly. And, and did you say, uh, is it seven positions now that we? It's we about seven see? positions, yeah. uh, and we're also trying to, you know, when you get around to reading the study that I wrote and stuff, we. You know, we did the reorg. We're looking at attrition. Every time someone retires, we don't just automatically place that. We yeah, see no, we're seeing good. if we can consolidate. Because yeah. even as you lessen and consolidate with new technology, I mean, we have to be 100% OSHA compliant where we were exempt in the past. All public employees have to be OSHA compliant this yeah. February. It's going to cost some money. I mean, I want to put it. This coming February. Yes. So we have to do an internal audit. Like, we have to be self-audited mm -hmm. first fines I mean it's it's a big huge deal yeah. mm -hmm. rest assured that all of the policies and procedures that Hamid and I have put in since we've gotten here are, are all OSHA based even though a lot of people would say to me why are we doing that we're exempt and I'm like because it's good business practice and that's what mm -hmm. we're doing and if there was an accident those are the rules that the Department of Labor would use to civilly fi fine you or, or sue you so we're we've been on track I, f I feel like we'll do well with the audit but again a lot of utilities are now hiring security, uh, you know, ma the security manager that handles cybersecurity, physical security, and, and then all of your OSHA compliance. I mean, things keep changing and jobs keep changing as technology and liability gets. Uh, sure. Uh, so, you know, we, we're trying to, you know, maintain the numbers, keep it low, keep it efficient. Yeah. No, no, actually, my question is more to making sure, yeah, because I know you've been running understaffed and that has consequences over the time in terms of what yeah. stress it puts on the existing staff so that's good thank you okay anything else no. Jason no. No. okay well I think we want to move to adjourn move adjourn, to adjourn Mr. regular Jones. session okay second second okay all those in favor yep. aye all right we're adjourned, we're adjourned.